Today is uh, day four of our LSU Mendel Food Symposium, and we will be discussing um, topics of food production and uh, food technology. My name is Ivana Tregenza. I am with the LSU Ag Center Global Network Office. And I just wanted to ask you to have patience with us today. Um, we are going to attempt to bring you a lot of visuals, many videos, and if we encounter any technical difficulties, please bear with us. We will be trying to um, fix them in a, in a background and bring it back to you, bring it up as, as soon as we can. As you know, technical difficulties are part of today's life and we will deal with them as best as we can. Um, with this, I would like to introduce today's session moderator, and that will be Dr. Miroslav Yuzel. Dr. Yuzel is of Mendel University and he is with Faculty of AgriSciences. And within Faculty of AgriSciences, he is with the Food Technology Department. He is not new to LSU Mendel cooperation by any means. He has been cooperating with us for close to five years now. And uh, some of the uh, interactions that we've had was uh, joint summer school, for example, for students, as well as Dr. Yuzel actually hosting some of the LSU students as part of their internship in the labs of Mendel University. So without any delay, Dr. Yuzel, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Ivana, for uh, introduction. Uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, students, uh, all who are connected and interested in food technology and production block, uh, let me appreciate the possibility that we meet as such a difficult COVID time, but yet so easily across continents and at different times we can see and hear uh, the presentations in food uh, science uh, and food technology and production block. So, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you can see uh, speakers uh, in my uh, this uh, yeah presentation, and uh, we have uh, changed uh, the Dr. Radka Langova. Uh, is is the expert in food of plant origin from Faculty of Agri Sciences of Mendelu, but she cannot join us. Uh, we will play her presentation at the end of this section. So uh, the first one will be my presentation. Uh, so uh, I will prepare. Dear ladies and gentlemen, let me share with you my contribution to this wonderful event. My contribution is the first in Thursday's food symposium program. The section deals with the topic of food technology. Food plays an essential role in our thinking and needs. Ensuring enough quality food was primarily and remain as a priority for each individual. We have this motto in the Food Quality and Safety Conference, Ingers Days. In the first week of March, we organized its 47th uh, year sequel. My presentation aims to inform you about our workplace, about Department of Food Technology, about its components and background, about the focus of our activities, pretend contacts and indicate the path we can take together. The main part of this contribution will be pre the presentation of the vision and uh, some questions 
about teaching and research in food science and technology. And also I want to inform you with my modest experience as a worker dealing primarily with uh, practical training and verification of processes, uh, development of new foods uh, in the field of uh, meat production. I would like to put something from experience and vision of Department of Food Technology. Because I will be followed by colleagues with their great sounding uh, topics, I will conclude uh, my offer in the field of uh, cooperation. Due to the conditions of the Faculty of Agri-Sciences, we are rather a smaller uh, workplace. We have 16 researchers from academics. We also use skillful uh, technical workers and PhD students. However, in 2013, we received a new background, new building that allow us uh, and to our students to enter the new dimension in practical teaching and experiments. I think we are unique in the Czech Republic because we can sell food products to consumers and at the same time we are not a vocational school. We are university. We meet strict conditions for the production and sale of the food. However, we are educating students as new inspectors for Czech agriculture and food inspection authority. Therefore, we could participate in food development and cooperate our activities with some companies. The individual section of the department provide teaching and scientific activities in analytical laboratories and pilot plant laboratories. The previous one gives us all the opportunity to gain new experiences. Analytical laboratories are an essential element of the Department of Food Technology. We use as background for direct education and scientific research, but also in cooperation with companies, where our students uh, often work with their diploma or doctoral thesis. The knowledge, skills and overview of available analytical techniques make our graduates as qualified staff. They can then work as a production manager, quality or analytical manager, research and development specialist, or inspector of the supervisory state bodies. We have brewery with a micro malt house with boxes controlled by the computer. Dr. Gregor can use standard raw materials, but also can produce experimental malt in scientific experiments. We are also preparing a lot of events for the public. The brewery is perfect PR tool. Beer is the liquid bread of our nation because we consume the most beer per person per year in the whole world. Recently, home brewing has been very popular in our country. And in the days when there was no COVID situation, I was the guide for the visit uh, to our Mendelu pilot plant labs. Visits usually ended in the brewery and thus uh, provided the participants with proper relaxation. Bakery products as uh, academics rolls or poppy seed croissant were awarded in regional competitions. My colleagues 
have some patents in the field of gluten-free food, especially pasta. Dr. Radka Langová will later talk as another speaker uh, about the processing of non-traditional raw materials and its preservation. Dr. Alana Salákova, as another presenting speaker, will introduce the dairy plant, uh, pilot plant laboratory and activity. Here is, for example, a cell biologist and microbiology professor, Sir Paul M. Nurse, who received the Nobel Prize in 2001. He visited us in 2020. And here is the photo of a very nice person from LSU tasting our poppy seed, seed croissants. We like poppy seeds and visitors. This photo is from the meeting uh, with Dr. Richardson from 2018, which took place in Mendel's Pavilion. And here you can see LSU students at summer school. Part of the teaching was about the production of pickled sausages. And this is from 2019. So, and why not go for a quick tour? Come with us for a short visit. So now, after the introductory introduction uh, of our background, we move on the next topic. So I will present my experience and some vision of practical form of teaching in the meat lab. Let's look at the meat pilot plant lab. First, you can see Czech butchers have the emblem of a lion. We are very proud of them. The basic activity is teaching. Without students, we cannot exist. We have direct education in courses, lectures, and indirect education in diploma work and uh, doctoral thesis activities. We need to do science and we are an agricultural university. We developed new products, some new kinds of food, some meat, sausages, salamis, with reformulated results. To do this, 
we need resources and background and new equipment. So we are very good equipped in food technology. We have machines comparable to companies and we can simulate the production in smaller companies, which we focus in some cooperation. Students soon appreciated the practical scope and focus of our teaching methods. Workshops and conferences organized for associations or supervisory bodies uh, or for companies expand our professional horizons. We are constantly adding experience and we are in contact with the users of research and development results. So you can see training for curry, the curry taste and nutrition ingredients and expertise is the big company, 45,000 of employees. We have equipment usual as in companies. I spoke about it. Students need knowledge about the meat structure and properties. You can see pH meter and pig carcasses. The knowledge of production vertical is the basic and important for understanding of uh, meat processing. Students in previous lessons gained information in context of animal breeding, feeding, and they need to be aware of the importance of meat production, but also they'll know about the chemical, physical properties of the meat. We do not educate new butchers, but we give to our students knowledge associated with a cutting meat. It is related to the sorting of meat and the production of quality meat products, food, sausages, and uh, the pandemic times associated with the COVID situation led us to start online teaching and filming of essential sections of meat production. Practical activities and experiences are important. Food technologists, our, our graduate, will better lead let their employees. They can show to ordinary employees their price and their level. This will force their recognition. It is also better to find out where the mistakes during uh, production occurred. Last year, we organized a local round of the competition for the best diploma thesis students. It took place in cooperation with the Federation of the Food and the Beverage uh, of the Czech Republic and the Czech Technology Platform for Food Staff. Both participants who advanced to the national round are currently employed. We teach students to acquire habits in food hygiene and whole control food processing. Students can control the meat processing and final quality of meat production only with technical knowledges. We do teach our students about questions, about systems for the good production and uh, traditional meat production, sausages, salamis, hams, head cheese, or preserved meat. We have almost 50 tried and tested meat products recipes at our disposal for teaching in practical lectures, we usually include five different types 
of sausages. Students will always practically try the filling in final shape of the meat product. It's very funny. The food safety is important part of the lectures. Here we can teach the importance and control process about heat treatment in smoker. We can show to our students the impact of non-compliance almost immediately. We use the experimental production and show examples of defects. COVID make us wear sanitary masks. Initially, we could have only 15 students in a group. After that, for months, only online teaching uh, was allowed. The rules within the European Union, which have been set in the past and we must comply with them, are very strict. Hygiene rules are also sufficient to reduce the risk of new treats. After production, students must clean the room and we must inspect it. In case of incorrect state, we will make them clean it again. This is the best way to learn the importance of disinfection and sanitation in food production. We can do quality food. But other important thing is to learn them, our students, about waste disposal, food hygiene, and together with the sustainability of whole process. We teach students the importance of small production in regional conditions. We gain some awards in some competitions. Production must be supplemented by related areas. Practical education leads our students to independence and creativity. Students gain a broad overview and can work in various processing companies. After all, food production includes common areas as food technology, food safety, and nutrition. Practical experience from all technologies allows our students to respond to the current demand of uh, employers depending on the place of their current residence. Thus, they do not have a problem adapting in professional job to new opportunities and challenges arising from their personal lives. Scola ludus, school by play. It's a motto from Jan Amos Komensky, John Amos Komenius. We look with respect to our teachers of theory and practice. And we are very grateful to for the knowledge we have acquired. We could inspire other followers. Well, now you know our possibilities, our vision, and we can focus on possible cooperation project. I appreciate the opportunity to visit LSU, which took place in 2016. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to your question and cooperation. So the first presentation, my presentation uh, is finished and uh, I see uh, some uh, questions in uh, chat. So uh, we can, uh, I can uh, answer. Uh, 
No, uh, the first uh, first question for uh, Jonathan. Uh, I have uh, no possibility to to, to cooperate uh, with LSU now, but uh, I will uh, be happy for uh, cooperation. So uh, we can do the meeting uh, in Friday. Uh, I will be uh, here as uh, uh, other guide uh, after food safety block, and uh, we can we can uh, talk about. So if uh, is uh, any possibility to do some project, uh, some cooperation, uh, especially in education or science, I will be happy. And the second uh, questions from Sarah. Thank you. Uh, do students ever introduce their own recipes? Uh, recipes? Uh, yes, our students. Uh, for, in master's degree, have a special uh, special course uh, and uh, uh, have possibility create uh, their own team uh, for uh, four to six people uh, for four to six students, and uh, uh, we have competition between them in best spice mixture uh, for sausage. So uh, it's very funny and uh, students uh, are very happy. So uh, I think uh, now uh, we will continue in program. Uh, the second uh, point uh, of our uh, scheme is uh, uh, team from faculty of uh, horticulture from Lednice. Uh, Dr. Ivo Soural and uh, Dr. Miroslav Horák. Uh, I uh, sent uh, uh, hello, hello. Uh, are, are you hear me? Yes, I, I, I hear you. Thanks. Thank you, thank you. You can, uh, Mr. Doctor, you can you can upload your uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation. Okay. And I will I will only uh, say some a few. Uh, words uh, together with Professor Josef Balík are these experts from uh, Faculty of Horticulture, as I mentioned. Uh, faculty is placed in South Moravia to the beautiful town of uh, Lednice. Uh, with uh, the local castle, it is a part of uh, the UNESCO heritage. So very nice and beautiful place. So uh, now uh, you can start your presentation. Okay, uh, thanks you for for inviting me. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you see the slide. Here's my slide. Yes, yes, I see. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, uh, hello everybody, uh, dear colleagues. I would like to uh, say you something uh, about our department. Uh, it is first part of this uh, presentation, and second part is about steel bands. Okay, okay, let's go. Uh, some outline about our department. Uh, uh, the name our department is Department of Post Harvest Technology of Horticulture Products. I would like to introduce uh, our staff, education activities, guaranteed courses, topics of thesis, laboratory and technical uh, background, research activities, uh, our scientific uh, focus area and uh, topics of research projects. Okay, our group uh, is uh, from uh, the, the, the many people. Uh, the head of our department is uh, Professor Balík. Our secretary Miroslav Viktorinová, and uh, we, we, we are academics or researchers uh, like uh, Dr. Nemcová, Professor Goliáš, me, uh, Dr. Hitz, Dr. Horák, Dr. Šnurkovič, uh, Dr. Kožišková, and uh, we have uh, also some uh, techniques and doctorants, uh, Mrs. Omastová, Mrs. Švestková. Mrs. Tocheklova and uh, Mr. Seriš. Uh, our education activities, uh, we offer a study program 
horticulture engineering. Uh, field of study is uh, quality of plant food sources. Uh, we have uh, 45 uh, students in bachelor studies. Uh, it's uh, around uh, 15 uh, students in each of three years. Uh, we have 20 students in master studies. It's about 10 students in each of two years. And we have uh, four PhD students. During the study, uh, students may obtain some certificates, uh, like a certificate of selected assessors for sensory analysis according to ISO-NORM, uh, or certificate of internal audit uh, for quality management ec uh, system according uh, to uh, ISO-NORM uh, again. Uh, we offer uh, guaranteed courses like uh, fermentation technologies, uh, food quality management, fruit distillates, fruit processing, methodology of sensory analysis, methods of food analysis, uh, this uh, package and packaging equipment, post-harvest technology, food chemistry, processing of horticulture products, food legislation, storage and processing of fruit and vegetables, storing of uh, horticulture products, technological laboratories, uh, technology of soft beverages and human nutrition. Uh, we, uh, we have uh, topics of uh, thesis uh, from uh, dissertation thesis. Uh, uh, it, it is a study of pre-fermentation and post-fermentation operation in cider production and uh, study of qualitative uh, parameters of beers with a fruit component, study of substance uh, component and organoleptic properties of absinthe, uh, study of antioxidant activity and synergistic effect in food. Uh, some uh, some master theses, uh, it's not all, but uh, the, the, the some only, uh, some selected, uh, like storage of leophysite apples, technology of fruit distillates production, analytical and sensory evaluation uh, of varietal fruits, uh, Juices, quality of small uh, fruits after uh, harvest and uh, du uh, during storage, evaluation of quality parameters of ciders. Uh, okay, now something about uh, our uh, equipment, about our laboratory and technological background. We have a new modern cold storage room for education and research. Uh, equipped uh, with eight boxes with adjustable composition of the atmosphere and temperature in the cold storage room, like random atmosphere, control atmosphere, and dynamic control atmosphere. Uh, our equipment industrial uh, is uh, liquid chromatography with fluorescence detector, gas chromatography, Fourier transformation near uh, spectro uh, spectrometer, UV spectrophotometer, colorimeter, hot air drying, freeze dryer, vacuum evaporator, penetrometer, uh, distillation equipment, and so on. Uh, something about uh, our scientific uh, area. Uh, we are focused on changes of compounds in fruit and vegetable during their cold storage in different composition of ambient atmosphere, especially aromatic compounds in fruit are studied here. Uh, methods of increasing the biology, uh, biological activity uh, components based on polyphenols in grape mast, optimization of storage condition of ASEAN peer varieties, the use of extracts of lignans to enhance the health benefit beverages, uh, uh, with cooperation with uh, the Nature uh, Wine Center of Czech Republic in the training and uh, selection of specialized uh, sensory uh, assessors of wine according to ISO-NORM. Uh, some of uh, our research projects uh, in these days, uh, like uh, food with high content on sulforaphane, this is uh, under the technology agency of Czech Republic. Uh, another one is use of new fruit species for long-term maintaining the production potential of fruit planting in changing climate. Uh, another one is use of grape vine cane for research and development of supplementary substance for biological plant protection. 
Okay, it was something, uh, some introduction about our uh, department, and now something, uh, some information about steel bands. Uh, the the top topic is use of steel bands to enrich food. Uh, when we look on the steel bands, we can see some uh, uh, some properties. Uh, steel bands uh, have positive effect on human health. Uh, they are antioxidants, antivirals, antimicrobials, uh, antihypertensive. Uh, they have protection of brain cells, uh, oxygen-free radical scavengers, uh, prevent cancer, and they can be used in uh, treating Alzheimer's disease and so on. Uh, we can uh, see some uh, structure. Here is resveratrol. This is the most important uh, steel band or very the, the most uh, known uh, steel band. And uh, pizza it like uh, monoglucosid of resveratrol. Uh, when we look on the contents uh, in wine, uh, it means in uh, in all almost all uh, different part of uh, plant material. We can see different distribution in the uh, berries, steam, leaves, shoots, and grape canes. It's very huge number in grape canes, uh, and uh, almost that doesn't means it is from blue varieties or from white varieties. Uh, when we uh, look on these uh, small uh, numbers detail, we can see uh, little higher contents in steams, uh, leaves, shoots, and uh, the smallest in is, uh, is in the berries. Uh, when we comparing contents of uh, uh, resveratrol in different uh, part of plant uh, between and uh, berries, we can see in the steam. It's around 150 times more than in berries. In the leaves and shoots, it's around uh, 50 ta 15 uh, times uh, more than in berries. But when we look on the grape cans, it's around 5,000 uh, more times uh, uh, resveratrol than in the berries, which is very, very uh, big amount. Uh, we uh, try uh, to increase uh, resveratrol content in the food. Uh, our uh, treatment is increasing the resveratrol content and antioxidant capacity also of uh, uh, grape juice by the thermomaceration by the this process. Uh, it's not only uh, our uh, job, but we uh, we uh, cooperated with uh, another two institution uh, like uh, Global Change Research Institute. Uh, under the Czech Academy of Science and Food Research Institute Prague. Uh, for thermomaceration, we used material uh, like two uh, white varieties, Miller Turgau and Greenveltrin, and also two red varieties like uh, Bla Blau Frankish and Saint Laurent. Uh, grapes originated uh, from conventional viticulture and uh, were produced in vineyard in Lednice, university training farm Japčice, and grapes uh, originated uh, from uh, the organic production labeled as Ork. Uh, variety Blau Frankish originated from the winery Gottberg in Popice, and organic grapes of the variety Greenveltrin were produced in the winery Binder in Rakvice. Uh, in the method, grapes uh, batches weighing 100 kilograms were destemmed, crushed, and after supplementation with L-ascorbic acid, which is it is it's uh, vitamin C, uh, 100 milligrams per kilogram, macerated as follow. Uh, first, vari first variant uh, A is without heating for 60 minutes at the temperature only 20 uh, until to 25 degrees of Celsius. Uh, another two variants, uh, D20 and D40, it means 20 minutes uh, of thermomaceration at uh, a higher temperature, uh, around 80 degrees of Celsius, or 20 uh, or 40 minutes of thermomaceration at uh, 80 degrees of Celsius. Juices uh, were pressed using a laboratory pneumatic press up to 0 0.2 megapascal and raked after two hours of standing at the temperature of five degrees of Celsius. Uh, then after these juices were pasteurized 
20 minutes at 85 degrees Celsius in a, a half liter dark uh, glass bottles uh, with crown uh, cups and storage uh, at 5 degrees of Celsius. Juices analysis were performed after one month using always three parallel samples. And uh, let's go to see some results, uh, which are very interesting. Uh, here is contents of resveratrol, and we have here three variant. Uh, first one is only maceration without uh, thermomaceration, and uh, another two are thermomaceration during 20 or 40 minutes. When we look on the on the results, we can see in each each variety of uh, uh, grape that juices uh, without thermomaceration has very small amount of resveratrol, but uh, juices uh, by the uh, thermomaceration process uh, have very uh, very uh, huge number of resveratrol. Uh, this is statistically significant increasing. Uh, contents of resveratrol uh, by the thermomaceration process. It, during the all varieties like Bra Frankish, Saint Laurent, Green Veltrina, uh, from organic or uh, conventional uh, production or Miller Turgan. Uh, when we look on the results about pizza eat, uh, again in milligram per liter, uh, we can see similar uh, results when only uh, maceration. Uh, is very small, uh, small by the uh, juices produced by the maceration uh, have small content of pizza eat, but juices uh, after the thermo maceration have uh, very uh, huge amounts of uh, pizza eat. Similar situation is similar. Uh, here is significant effects of level of pizza eat, same like on the resveratrol. Uh, let's go to look on the antioxidant capacity. And uh, here is many, many versions like uh, mineral turgau, only maceration and thermomaceration, green veltrin with maceration and with thermomaceration, uh, green veltrin from organic uh, production, again, maceration, thermomaceration, uh, Saint Laurent, only maceration and thermomaceration, blau frankish, again, maceration, thermomaceration, and from organic production, maceration and thermomaceration. And we can see again, uh, huge uh, increasing uh, uh, antioxidant capacity by the thermomaceration process that only the maceration it is during the all varieties and doesn't doesn't matter uh, about uh, organic production for or uh, organic production conventional on or organic production okay uh, some conclusion uh, thermomaceration of grapes results uh, result in a, a significant increase in level of trans resveratrol around 50 times uh, era, and uh, trans uh, pizza eight, nine times and antioxidant capacity 10 times of produce uh, grape juices the best results were uh, archived by the thermoceration uh, during the 20 minutes or 40 minutes at uh, 80 degrees of celsius of brown frankish grape must with content of resveratrol around uh, 8 milligrams per liter, uh, pizza eight around 20 milligrams per liter, and antioxidant capacity around 20 millimoles uh, of uh, uh, trolox or equivalent of trolox. Uh, these these uh, results uh, are about uh, uh, nutrition, but uh, it is not only about, about nutrition, but also about the uh, attractive uh, for the com uh, for the consumers. It means organolytic uh, properties. Beverages made of thermoacerates, red grapes, showed colors that were for consumers very attractive. This is another positive effect of thermoaceration. And uh, now it is all from me. And I would like to thank you for your attention and uh, for this symposium. And now I uh, look on the some question or uh, another part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soural, for your presentation. And the next one uh, will be your colleague from uh, Faculty of Horticulture, uh, Dr. Hurak. Uh, are you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Perfect, perfect. Uh, you can join us with your presentation. You can upload. So uh, 
I see uh, comments in chat. Uh, perfect, perfect uh, possibility to uh, to do some uh, connection uh, between LSU and uh, uh, Mendelo experts. So thank you for Dr. Boldor and Dr. Wu. Uh, I see uh, Dr. Wu is uh, connected too, uh, and I heard uh, that uh, there are experts in uh, your uh, in your uh, theme, in your topic. But now we will uh, continue with your presentation. So uh, please, Doctor, uh, now uh, you can start. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce you uh, our experiences with um, lignans and uh, their extract uh, from uh, plant materials and uh, their adding to the food. So, uh, I will try to share the presentation. Uh, could you tell me if you see the... Yes, I see. Thank you. So, uh, from the start, uh, some words about, uh, about lignans. So, what are lignans? Uh, lignans belong to a large group of phenol propanoids. Uh, which is a large of group of plant secondary metabolites. Uh, and um, these substances uh, have a very wide range of biologi biological functions and effects, uh, not only uh, plant itself, but also on the other organisms. Um, lignans uh, excel mainly in their, their antioxidant and anti-tumor, antiviral, antibacterial, uh, insecticidal, fungicidal and uh, anti-estrogenic also uh, effects against heart disease and other more. Uh, currently, there is a high interest in uh, polyphenols, not only from the scientific field, but also from the public, uh, especially when uh, using polyphenols as um, uh, phytopharmaceuticals or nutritional agents. Uh, in terms of structure, the lignans are composed of uh, two phenylpropan units, which are connected uh, through the central beta carbons of both side chains. Uh, they mostly form dimers, but uh, in the last few years, there have been higher lignans described in various softwood species. Uh, so lignans uh, are found in free form as aglicans, especially in wood, uh, woody plants, and uh, then attached uh, to a wide group of carbohydrates in the case of agriculture products. Here you can see the most common types of lignans. Uh, there are three lignan structural formulas of the most common lignans of uh, butanolite type is the left side. In the center is the butanediol and in the right is uh, bis epoxy. Here you can see if we uh, substitute on the thermal bonds of the appropriate functional group, we get the most well-known representative of lignans, 7-hydroxymethylazinol uh, in the uh, HMR. So, uh, <clears throat> occurrence of lignans in food uh, the highest concentration of lignans ever in food uh, were measured in linseed and, and in sesam seed. But other uh, important sources of lignans in our diet are wall grain, cereals, legumes, and other kind of vegetables, some kind of uh, fruit, as you can see, cranberries, uh, strawberries, uh, some nuts and wine, especially red is uh, not bad source of uh, lignans. And of course, the tea and coffee are a good uh, source of lignans. In our regular diet, we consume lesser lignans than the recommended amount. Uh, that was the reason why our team focused on the possibilities of isolation lignans or extraction from the plant materials and adding them to the food. Uh, Recently, it has been found that uh, the richest source of lignans are nuts of uh, Norway spruce, so uh, pizza ABS. And uh, 
that's why uh, we have been looking at, at ways to get HMR from, from knots of Norway spruce. Mm. Commonly, uh, lignans are extracted from plant material, but uh, also from ground spruce knots using polar solvents, uh, for example, ethanol or acetone, and their mixtures with water. Uh, this happens uh, usually after removing of uh, lipophilic substances through extraction with non-polar solvents, for example, hexane. The classical method of isolation HMR from spruce knots uh, consists in their extraction using ethanol and the precipitation of a poorly soluble HMR complex with potassium acetate. Uh, our patented technology uses hot water to extract lignans, in which resins uh, and other non-polar substances do not dissolve because resins uh, can be very problem with uh, extract uh, of lignans. Uh, using this uh, method, we obtain an extract uh, with a concentration about uh, 170 17 milligrams uh, per milliliter of uh, HMR. Sorry, uh, uh, 170 m uh, milligrams HMR per milliliter of extract. So uh, we also uh, try to added uh, lignans to the food, and the first food uh, to which we added lignans was grape must. Uh, we we uh, tried the white and red uh, varieties, so uh, white varieties was a greener wealth leader, uh, and uh, for red uh, red varieties was blau frank rich variety. Uh, we added lignans uh, in the form of wood chips uh, in uh, different concentration, or uh, in, uh, in the form of extract uh, of lignans. From the point of view of sensory properties, the most acceptable concentration for white masts were between uh, 13 to uh, 26 milligrams per liter. For red masts, uh, uh, with a uh, little bit higher concentration, uh, more uh, more acceptable, so from 28 to uh, 93, uh, 93 milligrams per liter. We uh, we also uh, taste uh, the added lignans to the wines, and uh, also we uh, we uh, try the white and red variety. So uh, we uh, add the lignans. Uh, in the form of uh, ground knots uh, from a concentration of 10 milligrams uh, lignans per liter. And uh, during the 14 days, uh, we uh, let the, the bottles in the temperature of uh, from uh, 15 to 20 uh, degrees of Celsius. In uh, during sensory evaluation, we found that uh, the optional con op optimal concentration of uh, lignans for white wines uh, is around 14, uh, 14 milligrams per liter, and for red wines, it's a little bit lower, uh, around uh, 12 milligrams per liter. So we also uh, add lignans to the beer because uh, beer, we think that beer is an ideal drink for additional of lignans because uh, they have a very similar taste to hops. Uh, the bitter and astringent taste is more suitable for beer than uh, for wine uh, from lignans. Uh, that is why we have uh, filled an application uh, for a European patent um, aimed to enriching beer with uh, lignans using uh, lignan extract or wood chips. We also try to add lignans to fruit and vegetable spreads, uh, and uh, we have best results with plum jam uh, with the addition of lignans, uh, where the, the best concentration was around 170 milligrams per kilogram. So we also added lignans to the chocolate uh, and in the corn shink process in various concentration and uh, in the in the chocolate taste, uh, the bitter taste of lignans uh, is very good because uh, 
uh, it does not significantly affect its taste, so you cannot uh, taste the, the, the lignans in the chocolate and you have the additional uh, additional lignans in the in the food. So uh, here is uh, here following publications uh, have been published uh, within our team. So uh, as you can see, we have four utility models and two patent, one uh, European patent application, and uh, eight uh, scientific articles. So uh, now uh, we're preparing the production of lignan beer uh, and also cosmetic cream with the addition of lignans with uh, some uh, external company and with uh, commercial brewery. So it's uh, all from me. If you have uh, any questions, we can answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hurak. And uh, I, see, I saw uh, the conversation in chat of this meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bordor and others uh, for uh, conversation. It was perfect. And uh, uh, if uh, there is uh, no question, I rec recognized uh, one question to sweet potatoes uh, more. Uh, so uh, only uh, have uh, uh, some uh, little notice uh, that uh, sweet potatoes uh, in Czech Republic are not usually on uh, the plates of uh, our uh, consumers. Uh, we prefer uh, Solanum tuberosum, classical potatoes, and uh, we usually meet them in uh, limited quantities uh, in the market and uh, some uh, consumers are interested uh, in trying uh, some uh, ingredients and uh, raw materials, so, so only for this uh, notice. So, and uh, hello, uh, <laughs> Dr. Joan King uh, is here. Uh, perfect. And uh, we will continue in our program. Uh, the next uh, will be Dr. King, uh, her current uh, research area and intention of research is on characterizing and utilizing uh, new ing ingredients uh, in food product development. It's perfect for our uh, section, uh, today's section and her specific topic for the presentation will cover uh, work completed by her students. Uh, it's very nice. And uh, developing uh, in gluten-free products, uh, I think uh, our colleagues uh, from our department uh, doing uh, this science, it will be perfect uh, possibility to cooperation. So uh, thank you, Dr. King, uh, and you can start with your presentation. Do you see my presentation? Yes, I see presentation. Uh, one little moment. I see the hands uh, hand up uh, from Ivana. Uh, is here some problem, Ivana? Hello, thank you. No, there is no problem. I just wanted to let the Lignin team uh, know that we also have with us Dr. Wu from uh, LSU um, faculty or, or College uh, of Agriculture. <laughs> Uh, and Department of Forestry, and he has done also study, uh, extensive studies on lignin, and we will try to either attempt to share that link in a chat or we will include him in the email so the team can then follow up. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. Okay, we all set. All right, today I'm, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, research that mainly one of my students has worked on and a little bit of a survey that another one of my previous students had, had done. But first I want to talk a little bit about um, gluten-free and gluten products. Um, 
There's about 6% of children and approximately 4% of adults in the U.S. that have food allergies and or intolerances. And approximately 1% of the population um, in the U.S. <clears throat> sorry, there's something in front of my screen. Has a celiac disease. Also, these problems such as gluten sensitivity, intolerance, and autoimmune disorders like celiac disease are rising um, across the world. And it's estimated that for every person that's diagnosed um, with these problems, there's five to ten people that remain undiagnosed. For celiacs, um, they're recommended not to eat anything that has gluten products in it. Um, only one milligram of gluten a day could cause damage of the intestinal mucosa of the villi. Um, in Europe, they allow a product to be labeled as gluten-free if they have less than 200 parts per million of gluten. A study that was done um, in 2004 found, though, that even some products that were labeled gluten-free um, contain 300 milligrams of gliadin um, per kilogram. So therefore, another study following up on that uh, found that there was still damage um, to intestinal mucosa of people um, even though they weren't showing some symptoms uh, typical for celiac disease. Um, and it was because they were eating supposedly gluten-free products, but they contained gluten. <clears throat> um, gluten-free products uh, interest has increased um, because 30% of Americans in the U.S. Uh, showed interest in avoiding gluten. And 65% <clears throat> of the American adults believe that gluten-free foods are healthier. Also, there's about 27% that choose gluten-free foods because they believe that it assists them in losing weight. <clears throat> and young adults um, who tend to be healthy in their lifestyle and also hate eight healthier products, 13% um, of those people uh, valued gluten-free uh, foods as being healthy. So gluten-free grains, or sorry, gluten grains are identified by the gliadin protein. So those uh, sources that have gliadin in them are wheat, rye, barley, and oats, mainly in any um, products produced with them or crosses made in the grains. In the US, the FDA stated that foods could be uh, labeled gluten-free if they are inherently gluten-free or one of three things, they do not contain an ingredient that is either from a gluten-free, sorry, from a gluten-containing grain, or if it's derived from a gluten-containing grain that hasn't been processed to remove all the protein, like wheat flour, which has protein in it, um, or derived from a gluten-containing grain um, that's been processed to remove gluten, uh, like wheat starch, but we know that wheat starch or any starches could have residual proteins and lipids in there. Um, and in the U.S., the final product, in order to be labeled gluten-free, has to have less than two, 20 parts per million, which is less than what Europe requires. So uh, gluten-free grain, grains are those that don't contain uh, the prolamins, like gliadin, um, and they do not cause damage to the intestinal villi, um, which causes celiac disease. There are problems when trying to replace wheat in products, um, especially in baking, um, because it results in low uh, volumes of the product and uh, a harder crumb texture. Also, <clears throat> um, gluten-free flours are missing um, that elasticity um, functionality of the gluten, so that results in the um, denser products. So sometimes people add flour, starches, or other hydrocolloids um, to help uh, fix the texture. And it's been suggested uh, of different products to add, like guar gum, uh, xanthan gum, um, egg powder, whey protein, um, to help with textural and, and taste problems. So gluten, we know, has the glutenin and the gliadin. The glutenin gives us the elasticity um, properties, and the gliadin gives us the viscosity that we need and together we get a nice texture of gluten. Um, so you can see on the right-hand side that uh, gluten-free bread 
um, depending on what it's made with. Um, if it's, it doesn't have other ingredients to help with its texture, um, could be uh, shorter in height um, than a regular uh, wheat containing bread. Um, this is due to not having the gluten structure to maintain the small um, pockets of gas to give you that light airy texture. When you have large pockets of uh, bubbles, um, those bubbles collapse and the whole product um, decreases in height and, and volume. <clears throat> One of my students did um, a market survey of gluten-free products in this area, um, and she found a total of 556 gluten-free products. So remember that it can be labeled gluten-free um, if it doesn't contain anything that's gluten-free normally. <laughs> Sorry, if it doesn't contain anything that has gluten in it normally. Um, so this could include all kinds of things that normally wouldn't contain gluten anyway. Um, such as some frozen meals, um, some yogurts, you know, you don't normally are adding um, wheat proteins or other proteins like that to those products. Um, so there was a lot of products that were labeled gluten free. She also um, did a survey of uh, celiac consumers. So these were people that had celiac disease. Um, and she had 84 people respond to the survey and they, what they were looking at was a list of products that were normally um, gluten-free products that they may or may not have seen before. And 54 of all those products um, were found to have defects um, as noted by the celiac consumers. The main issues were taste and texture. So there's like over 200 um, uh, results of taste and texture for different uh, products of you know the different types of the same product and then about one fourth or one half of the um, taste and texture issues were associated with odor and color and the biggest problems uh, were with bread products <clears throat> more recently <clears throat> there was a higher protein uh, rice variety developed um, by the LSU Ag Center Rice Research Station by Dr. Winifreda and uh, Dr. Utomo. Um, this was a, a non-GMO uh, variety named Frontier that was released in 2017. A company in Illinois uh, purchased the rights uh, to that rice so they could uh, grow it up in Illinois. And currently they're selling it under the name Cahokia. This rice has uh, an average content of 10.6% protein, whereas regular basic rice is usually around five or 6% protein. So we wanted to look at this and, and a company um, hired us to look into products made with this. So the first thing uh, my student did uh, was do a market survey of what kind of products contain rice flour in general in the market. And she found mainly that um, the snack products and the breakfast uh, products contained rice flour. There were also options for gluten-free rice, uh, sorry, gluten-free rice flours and mixes. Um, but one of the least areas was uh, the gluten-free breads. So that was one area of interest to us based on the previous work that I showed also. And when looking at these products, they didn't only contain rice flour, they contained other ingredients also. Um, but what we wanted to know is what was the carb levels and what was the glycemic load? Um, so we can see that pasta and flour mixes um, had the greatest levels of carbohydrates. And so that resulted in the greatest glycemic loads for those products. So we're interested in, in trying to um, determine ways of trying to enhance protein content and gluten-free products. Um, and this high protein rice flour was one option for us to do that. So we developed bread and also muffins. And <clears throat> this table shows you the, uh, the firmness and the height of gluten-free rice bread. Um, that we made with the high protein rice flour. So we also compared it to commercial rice flour that's not high protein. Um, and then we had also the brown, which is the B 
for both the commercial and the uh, high protein rice flour and the white um, flour uh, for both of these. And we found there was actually no difference in height between the commercial and the higher protein rice flour breads. But we did find um, some differences um, depending on whether it was the brown rice flour or the um, white rice flour as far as firmness goes. Um, so we think that maybe that um, because you have more fiber and a little bit more protein in the, uh, the brown rice flours, um, that that resulted in greater firmness of the product. We also did a sensory evaluation of the breads to compare them, and we actually found no differences at all um, in the crumb color, the softness of the bread, the moistness, the flavor, or the overall acceptance of uh, the bread products. So having higher protein um, rice flour in the bread um, didn't affect the properties negatively compared to a regular protein rice flour. One issue though with the bread is we need to do some kind of improvement uh, sensory wise um, to increase the acceptance scores because we prefer to have an acceptance score above six out of a nine point scale. We also looked at the effect of a health message on purchase intent of the gluten free rice flour bread. So we asked them purchase a tent before we gave them a message. And then we gave them a message that this was a gluten free bread made with high protein rice flour. And what we found is for the brown high protein rice flour, we had an increase of 10 to 11 percent um, in purchase intent after telling them that this was made with a high protein rice flour. For the white one, uh, the white high protein rice flour, we only found about a 5% increase. But this would be a good marketing um, way to get people to buy this by saying that we have a higher protein rice flour in there. We also looked at uh, gluten free muffins and we looked at the color of the crust and the crumbs in these cases. Uh, we were finding that the uh, white high protein rice flours tended to have lighter color for both the crust and the crumb. Um, this again could be due to slightly higher protein contents in the brown rice flours versus white rice flours um, because we're leaving more of the, the brand area on there when we have the rice. And so you could get more Maillard browning, um, but it could also be related to uh, more pigments being there associated with the brown rice, uh, which we can see in, in the uh, reddish color that we see here is greater in the brown rice um, flour products. We didn't really see too much difference in the uh, yellow, except for when we're looking at the crumb color. For texture um, of the muffins, we found that um, the commercial white rice flour had the lowest hardness um, so that meant that these uh, muffins were softer. They were similar to the commercial brown rice, um, but were lower than the high protein um, flours in this case. We also had uh, better cohesiveness in that um, commercial white rice flour. And then also um, the gumminess was lower in the commercial white rice flour, um, as well as the chewiness. So the commercial white rice flour product um, texture profile wise um, by instrumental analysis seemed to be better than the others. Then we did a sensory evaluation um, and we found similar types of results where color was preferred in the white high protein rice flour. So that meant that the consumers preferred a lighter color um, of the muffins. Um, we did not find differences in aroma, the crumbliness, uh, the moistness, the softness, or the flavor itself. Um, and then overall acceptance was not affected statistically um, by that color only because of all the other um, sensory attributes being similar statistically. The great thing about the uh, muffin sensory though is that our scores are above six 
uh, for our high protein muffins, which means that these are um, quite acceptable uh, to the consumers. <clears throat> Again, uh, we looked at the health method message on uh, purchase intent of gluten free muff muffins um, and also compared to the commercial. When we uh, gave them the health me message for the uh, commercial brown rice flour, uh, we just said that it was made with rice that was gluten free made with rice flour. Um, again, when we uh, used the high protein uh, rice flour, we said that it was made with a it was gluten free made with a high protein rice flour. So if we're just looking at whether it's gluten free made with rice flour, that increased uh, uh, five percent um, in the purchase intent after the message. But when we looked at the high protein rice flour, we found an increase of nine. Uh, to 12 percent, um, depending on whether it's brown or white, high protein rice flour um, for the muffins. So again, that health message and the point that it is a higher protein uh, rice flour um, helps with um, having people uh, increase their purchase intent. So uh, in conclusion, uh, both of the white rice flour breads had less firmness uh, than the respective brown rice flour breads. Uh, the muffin hardness, gumminess, and chewiness were similar, um, but the commercial white rice flour muffins were less firm than the high protein rice flour muffins. And the color of the high protein white, white rice flour muffins was more acceptable to consumers. There were no differences in sensory attributes between commercial rice flour and high protein rice flour breads. Um, so they can act similar um, to the lower protein um, breads. And a key thing is that the uh, health me message of the uh, greater protein content of the flour had an influence on increasing uh, purchase intent for breads and muffins. I'd like to acknowledge um, some of my students, uh, Gabriela Paz, who did the majority of the work on the uh, muffins and and bread with a high protein uh, rice flour. Um, Ricardo Santos Elman, who was an intern um, that started from Zamorado and became one of my master's students. Um, he did some of the first formulations with the high protein rice flour and he was working on cupcakes. We have yet to, uh, we're working on his publications right now. He completed his thesis last year. Um, Mr. Bob Butcher at Cahokia Rice. Um, who provided uh, samples of the rice flour for us to work with. A bubbling well road LLC, which is a, a side company of Mr. Butcher, who actually funded the research that we did with the high protein rice flour. Uh, Dr. Uh, Priniawawakul, our, our sensory and product development specialist in our department, who, are, who has the um, control of the sensory lab, um, for his help um, with especially the statistical analysis um, for our sensory uh, data and on all my students. And Annette Bentley, who was my first student that got me interested in the gluten-free area, uh, she was actually a, a person who had celiac disease. So it was uh, close to her heart uh, to trying to figure out how to make a bread um, that was acceptable to celiac people. Um, I want to thank all the students and staff of the LSUX Center Sensory Laboratory um, because they help us a lot when we're running uh, sensory evaluations and, and figuring out uh, how we want to ask our questions and how to run the uh, systems. I want to thank Ivana Tregenza uh, for inviting me to uh, do this presentation. And I want to thank LSU Ag Center and Mendel University for putting on this symposium. Uh, thank you for attention. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your presentation, Dr. King. And uh, please, uh, I think uh, I, I heard. Uh, uh, yes, yes, it's OK now. Uh, some problem with microphone. Uh, so uh, if I see the comments, uh, here is uh, one question. Uh, for uh, Dr. Uh, King uh, from uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Alena Salakova, is the use uh, of rice flour co uh, common in the US? Uh, what other gluten-free flours are, are used in the US? Uh, could, you, could you answer 
please, uh, Dr. King. Um, we were looking mainly at uh, which products had rice flour, um, but there could be products that use uh, soy flour, for example, um, sorghum flour um, and cookies. I've seen that. Um, but when when making these gluten free products, a lot of times we have to add other ingredients, as was mentioned, um, such as tapioca flour, uh, corn starch, um, xanthan gum to help with the products. Um, but I don't have a list of all of the other um, grains that are used in gluten free products in the U.S. I think you are muted, Dr. Yuzo. We still don't have your sound. This microphone may be not working well. No, we barely not. hear you. Very least low. And now it does appear as if your microphone actually went. Those are some of the technical difficulties that just happen, part of life. So maybe what we can try is um, to um, uh, get out of this meeting and try again, if that's okay with you, Dr. User. And I do believe, Dr. King, I will follow up if you don't mind uh, and put you in contact with some of the colleagues at Mendel University so we can potentially have a discussions about perhaps a joint projects if that's of an interest. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. And I believe that um, next time, next we have a presentation from Dr. Salakova from Mendel University. And Normally, we would ask Dr. Yuzel to share it, but since he needs to do some exercise here, Miss Sarah, would you be able to share that with us from your computer, perhaps? Yes, just a moment. Uh, I will I'll upload it uh, alone. It's it's no problem. It's not that you want to do it from your end. Don't forget the sound button, share the sound. That's yes. been all of our nemesis. So I would like to say hello to everyone. Uh, good morning to US, uh, good afternoon to the Czech Republic. So I will, I will prepare my presentation. Uh, I will prepare it. Uh, uh, to 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 show some uh, tour to dairy to dairy section uh, in our department. Uh, I will share uh, the the video. Um, I must I must open it in my computer. So.
OK, everyone bear with us. We are working on it. Uh, my name is Alena Salakova. Uh, let me introduce dairy section. Our dairy team consists of my person and uh, our friend Kau Yulcha. My colleagues are Jana Zemanová. She specialized for dairy technology and laboratory analysis and Libor Kalhotka uh, from another department. He specialized for microbiology. And we cooperate with other colleagues from our department. I do everything. We also cooperate with other universities and research institutes in the Czech Republic and Slovakia yet. Our field is uh, from the production cheese, uh, for example, fresh cheese, steamed cheese, ripened cheese, whey cheese, acid coagulated cheese, uh, quark cottage cheese and cheese analogs uh, to the production of other dairy products as yogurt and so on. We want to start with ice cream production. Now you can see some photos. Uh, we do research uh, in the field of quark cottage cheese. We evaluate the influence of uh, protective cultures and kind of packaging or other technological aspects on sensory microbiology and physicochemical characteristics of cottage cheese. Uh, we have near infrared spectroscopy machine for evaluation quality parameters of raw materials and products. And we cooperate with other colleagues with uh, some other different laboratory technology. Our research focused on cheese analogs. We make fresh and semi-hard group of cheese analogs. A part of milk fat is replaced by plant oil. For example, hazelnuts, linseed, rapeseed, and by fish oil. Uh, you can see photo from the production of cheese analogs in our dairy technological room. Uh, we also working on acid coagulated cheese. We use different coagulants, for example, Wingard, Wine Wingard, Balsamic Wingard, Balsamic Wingard with orange and strawberry flavor. The cheeses then have flavor and color on Wingard, but the taste isn't acid. We try to use different heating process and different materials. For example, spray milk. Uh, you can see the production of fresh goat cheeses on this side slide. Uh, the production uh, continues about 24 hours and goat's milk behaves slightly differently compared with cow's milk. Uh, steamed cheeses are very popular in the Czech Republic. You can see the shots uh, from production in our dairy technological room. Uh, we prepare steamed cheese from goat milk and cow milk. Uh, dairy technological room is also used for teaching of students in dairy subjects. We teach dairy technology in English for foreign students. Students work in small groups with less amount of milk. Or students work in larger group with 50 to 70 liters of milk. Students do everything themselves. Here you can see cheeses made by students as part of the practical lessons. Students do sensory evaluation of their products at the end. And here um, is yogurt and butter. Uh, we do some exper experiments um, within diploma thesis. 
uh, our students also do basic analysis of milk and dairy products. It is very difficult to do laboratory analysis online. We prepare photo guide for students, but uh, that is not it. Uh, we organized Milk Day at Mendelu. It is a day full of lectures for students and the general and professional public. The first Milk Day at Mendelu was in 2011, and this year the day was online on private YouTube channel. After a week, there were 935 views. We also cooperate with the dairy company, Small Farmers and Czech Moravian Dairy Association. And a little relief at the end, my experience with American sprayed cheese. One evening I switched TV channels and came across the detective series Liesl Weapon. I went through the internet and found that I could order cheese at the Czech Republic and I tasted it. This is my experience. So thank you very much for your attention and we are looking forward to possible cooperation. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, uh, I had uh, some technical problems with uh, my microphone. I think uh, now it's okay. Do you hear me, uh, Dr. Salakova? Yes, <laughs> okay, thank okay. you, thank, thank you very you. much thank you. For, for loading uh, the presentation. And uh, there is some discussion in the chat. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Ariana uh, during uh, summer school in Brno. I take photo with him. <laughs> Okay, uh, and uh, I see uh, other comment uh, from uh, Dr. King. Uh, thank you, uh, her for it. And uh, does uh, your dairy debt uh, have a store to sell products from uh, now? Uh, so uh, we prepare products uh, only for for students uh, during during lecture or uh, for for some research research uh, now we um, we don't have uh, permission for for selling uh, dairy products uh, to some market or so on okay thank you thank you very much uh, i'm very sorry <laughs> i had a question uh, to dr king uh, that uh, if, if we can uh, discuss uh, uh, how, how do students enjoy your lectures, uh, Dr. King? And then uh, could uh, uh, answer uh, Dr. Salakova too. So uh, are you connected, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Dr. King? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a little question because uh, how, how do students uh, from LSU enjoy lectures? Are the uh, LSU students experienced in baking bread or muffin before they come to your lectures? And how big is the problem with uh, uh, celiac disease of your students? Oh, um. They don't necessarily have any experience baking other than you know what they do at home although we've had some students come from with a culinary background they've gone to school to get um, culinary degrees before they came to our program to get their bachelor's degree in food science um i, I seem to get good marks on my uh teaching and and lecturing um so the students tend to like our my uh, food chemistry class that i teach um because I, I, I don't just talk about the basic um, ingredients that are in the foods. I talk about how they're applied, you know, as a food ingredient and how their structure affects the um, functionality in the products. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, one question um, uh, to Dr. Salakova, because uh, next uh, lecture will be or contribution will be from uh, Dr. Beneke and it's uh, for ice cream production. So uh, my, my question is aimed to Dr. Salakova about ice cream. 
Uh, we want uh, to start with ice cream. Uh, we we have only small freezer for ice cream, and uh, we will see what what will be uh, on future. And uh, our students uh, like practical training in uh, their technological room. Uh, they like sensory analysis at the end um, because they they uh, taste their products. But uh, in this time, it's uh, very difficult to teach practical practical training because everything must be online today. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. And now we will continue uh, in program scheme. Uh, Dr. Charles Benecke uh, is the next one speaker. Uh, is uh, associated professor in the School of Nutrition and uh, Food Sciences uh, in the LSU AG Center. So very nice uh, person, I think. Uh, I remember uh, the taste of uh, LSU ice cream uh, in uh, 2016. I, I tasted uh, the, I think, uh, LSU Tiger ice cream. So Tiger. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, uh, his presentation will be in the form of video and uh, for 20 minutes. So uh, are you hear me, uh, Dr. Beneke? Yes, can you hear me? Perfect, perfect. So uh, let's let's start with uh, your contribution. All right, great. Thank you guys for uh, for for hosting me and uh, and having us and putting this on. It's been it's been really really great. Uh, let's see if I can get my presentation to upload. Let's see. Don't forget the sound button since I believe there is a little video in there to share the sound. Right. It didn't um it did not it did not click. Let's try this. All right, can everybody see that? We see the presentation and we also see your sidebar of okay. the upcoming slides. Great, great. Let me do... All right, if everyone can, can kind of see that. Uh, it's showing full screen on mine, but I'm not sure if everyone that's the full the full thing, but I think we can kind of make it we can kind of make it work. Um, let me start by by uh, telling you a little bit about myself. I uh, I've I've worked at LSU for about 30 years, and and I specialize in uh, in dairy, dairy foods, and dairy processing. Um, I I am the faculty member in charge of our dairy processing facility. And our and our retail outlet, our dairy store. We have a, uh, a retail outlet on campus where uh, we sell all of the uh, the products that we produce uh, in in house. We also have our our own uh, dairy dairy farm. Um, we milk about a hundred Holstein cows uh, a couple times a day. We're we're not quite large enough to utilize all of their all of their milk. Uh, uh, most of it winds up going to a uh, to a, a local dairy where it's processed mostly into fluid products. But uh, some of it we do we do receive, and we um, we use it to manufacture ice creams and cheeses mainly. Uh, we also do research projects. We help a lot of industries. Uh, we work with uh, with Nestle, Unilever. Uh, flavoring companies on different projects, uh, putting uh, new products together for them uh, and helping to test those uh, using sensory evaluation and other techniques. Uh, the, the first, the picture here that you see is a picture of one of our food incubator tenants. The creamery here at LSU 
we actually house three, uh, three small companies that uh, came to us with an idea. And uh, this, this gentleman right here is holding a gourmet popsicle. Uh, it's purple and gold, which matches our school colors. It's, uh, it's lemon and blueberry. And kind of what he does, he, he was displaced by one of uh, the large hurricanes that came through uh, his town in Lake Charles last year. And uh, it destroyed his facility. It did destroy his equipment. And he came to us. Uh, asking us if he could be housed here. We set him up in, in one of our processing rooms. Uh, he has a lot of molds, uh, popsicle molds. Uh, he makes probably 50 or 60 different gourmet flavors uh, of ice cream. Uh, let me see if I can get the next slide to come up. And you can see some more here uh, of the pop, different popsicles that, that he manufactures. And we helped him kind of get started probably six or seven years ago with this with this food venture that he's uh, that he's created. He also manufactures gourmet ice creams. Uh, we make a lot of ice cream ourselves here for retail sales, so it was a, a really good fit. He uses uh, our equipment. Uh, this little batch freezer that we have here. Uh, does about 20 liters of ice cream in roughly eight minutes. And I think this is one of his uh, cream cheese ice creams that, that he has created. Uh, that's a picture of the little, uh, the little batch freezer that we, uh, that we utilize. Um, let's see, is everybody seeing, uh, seeing the screen and stuff okay, Ivana? Yes, we do. We don't see it full screen, but I think we can work with this. Okay, cool. I'm not sure quite why it's uh, why it's not doing like it should do, but um, I guess we'll take what we can get. <laughs> uh, this is a, a, a picture of some of the other equipment that we have. Uh, we have a uh, roughly it's a 3,800 liter per hour continuous pasteurizer or high temperature short time pasteurizer and homogenizer that we utilize to, to pasteurize all of our dairy products, our milks and creams uh, that we use in cheese and also that we utilize in, uh, in ice cream mixes. Uh, we have a uh, 300 gallon processing tank that we use to uh, mix all of our uh, raw ingredients in and blend for our ice cream mixes. And we also have a, a very small, uh, it's like a miniature past, continuous pasteurization system. And uh, what we utilize it for is mainly research and development type products. Uh, we've done a, a lot of work with uh, different juices, uh, watermelon juice. Uh, we've worked some with sweet potatoes, with soy, um, uh, all kind of different things with coffee beverages. Uh, we've looked at uh, helping to improve frothing for cappuccinos and lattes, different properties of milk and uh, how they relate to different heat, uh, heat processing parameters on the milk. Uh, we've got some little small vats, cheese vats that are set up uh, to do mainly research and development type product projects with uh, with industry that want to try a new cheese flavor and uh, we utilize those uh, a pretty good bit for that now let's see if i can get this to um to work it's a little short video here uh, the little batch freezer that i was telling you guys about um, it uh, about eight minutes we've got uh, three or four of those white tubs of ice cream um, we also have a uh, a large uh, bottling line uh, that's housed in a different part of, of our facility uh, this this machine is a piston filler and i can kind of i can get it to play here it's got a uh, 
associated with the invention of the international air transposer to a distance filler. And right now we're filling, uh, I believe that Caesar salad that we're filling on that machine. Then those bottles go down to the capital assembly. This cap is that From there it goes to the Gunshot. Dr. Benecki, I believe we have a little bit of audio issue here. Okay, let me stop that. Is that better? Yes, we can hear you. It's the the sound of the movies, of the, the video. What we're going to do, everyone, we, we will share this uh, with our other presentations and you will be able to watch the video, but I hope that you got a, enough of visual from Dr. Bonecki at this point. Sure. I've got some other pictures there. I'll just scroll through them really fast. Uh, that's the ion air rinser. I, uh, basically what it does, it injects ion, ion charged air into the bottle and it also vacuums the bottle out uh, right after that rinse. So any contaminants that are in there, they get sucked out. And then the next one is just kind of a little shot of the uh, coming out of the cap or assembly that puts the, uh, the caps on the bottle. So uh, with that said, uh, we've, we've got a lot of different things that, that, uh, that we do. Uh, we help a lot of uh, small companies and a lot of industry uh, if they need technical assistance uh, and things like that. So with that said, um, if I can exit out of this. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Beneke. Uh, sorry uh, for uh, technical problems, but uh, now uh, if uh, is anybody here who can uh, ask uh, Dr. Beneke about uh, what do you uh, what do you saw in uh, her, in his presentation, you can now ask him. So Let's it was, uh, it was, I saw, yes, I, I saw one, which flavor of ice cream is the most interested and how yes. long does it take, uh, <laughs> how long does it take to taste all, all of them? Um, we, we do quite a bit of, quite a bit of, of, uh, of tasting of the products. We, we let students develop some of the flavors that we, uh, that we sell in our, in our dairy store. Uh, Believe it or not, the, the, most, the most popular flavors that we sell are chocolate and vanilla. Uh, that's, that's, the most, that's the most popular ones. Probably the one, the one right after that would be Tiger Bite, which is uh, vanilla with uh, uh, a blueberry uh, swirl that's, uh, that's inside of it. So that's about the most popular ones. Yes, and I see uh, a comment uh, from Ivana in chat, and uh, you can join uh, join the Ivana with uh, your uh, favorite taste of uh, ice cream, if you can. Oh, perfect! Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, I think uh, it's uh, 
traditional uh, for ice cream. The most favorite is uh, vanilla ice cream, chocolate ice cream, and so on. Uh, do you agree, Dr. Salakova? Ah, uh, now we can hear uh, Dr. Salakova. Yes, yes, agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, now if you uh, if you uh, so we can we can continue. It's better to continue because uh, we have uh, another speaker, uh, Ms. Ashley Gutierrez. Thank you, uh, Dr. Benek. Maybe will be uh, another question. Uh, you can you can uh, answer in chat. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, for your contribution. And we will uh, continue in the program. Uh, Miss Ashley Gutierrez is the lead food scientist. Ah, perfect. I see you. Uh, hello. Uh, of, uh, for the LSU AG Centers Food Incubator. And she is also the manager of Sensory Service Lab uh, for the School of Nutrition and Food Sciences. It's perfect theme in our program. Uh, we have some uh, other colleagues uh, from uh, sensory uh, laboratory from our department I see in in uh, that join us and uh, uh, Miss uh, Ashley Gutierrez uh, she is experienced uh, in the areas of product development too and food regulation and teaching and I think it's uh, the great possibility for our colleagues to cooperate so now you can uh, you can uh, upload your presentation and uh, let's go start. Okay, I'm going to try to upload right here. Give me just a minute, please. Okay. Can everybody see that? Okay. Yes, I see. But okay. uh, the difficult could be uh, with uh, sound. Uh, you can try. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. OK. OK, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ashley Gutierrez, and today I'm going to be talking a little bit about our food incubator program as well as our innovation center. Um, when I was speaking with, with Gay Sandoz, our director, about kind of what what to speak with you about today. We thought it would be a good idea to show kind of the history of the food incubator, um, where we are now and where we would like to go in the future. So I'm going to go over that um, today. I do want to introduce you to our food incubator staff. Um, we have a wide variety of backgrounds, which I think really helps our tenants and Louisiana food companies. Um, our director is Gay Sando. She has many years of experience in the food industry. Um, she's been very successful, has a lot of background in, in food businesses and a lot of expertise. And um, so she she really helps our tenants a lot with, with the business and part of, of the program, as well as giving them ideas about what sort of products may work well in the marketplace. We have Jason Guilfor, who's our operations manager, Tony Barber, who um, manages our facilities, um, bottling plant manager, Dr. Gabriella Crespo, she's a food scientist and she's the plant manager of our food, animal and food science labs baking kitchen. Myself, Dr. Beinecke, who just spoke, um, and then Marta Pensari, she's our tenant services assistant and she does our graphic design and food photography. So you can see the wide variety of backgrounds that we actually have, uh, which again benefits our program. Um, we help them with everything from business, marketing, um, product elimination. Sometimes they come with us with an, to an, for an idea of 20 products and Gay helps them narrow down to start with one product and then as they grow they expand. Um, everything from scale up, optimization, label design, nutrition panels, food safety plans, um, we, we help them with all of that. 
In addition, we have our student workers, and I'm going to touch on this again later in the presentation, Jonathan Francis, Nick Musso, and Jareth Wheeler. Um, we two of these students are um, students in our food science program, and so they're getting a lot of experience uh, working in our incubator. A little bit about our program. At its core, it is an economic development program. Um, it started with the goal of helping small businesses get their products into grocery stores. And it began in 2013, in June of 2013. That's when Gay, um, with the support of the LSU Ag Center, uh, opened the doors to the food incubator with 10 companies. And as we've grown, we've been able to provide services and support to medium and large food companies as well. Um, so initially it began as a way so if a company or if a person has a product like a pasta sauce that they want to get into the grocery store but they don't know how to do it they don't know how they may need to change their recipe to make it last a longer time or how to make it shelf stable so it can be sold on the grocery store shelf instead of in the refrigerated section what kind of packaging they need how do they register their businesses with both the department, the Louisiana um, Secretary of State's office and with the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. And so we started doing that, helping them with all of these steps. And as we grew, we began um, to offer other services as well, which, we'll, which I will talk about in a minute. But we offer expertise, facilities and resources for the tenants to actually come in and make their products and then services. So we really want to be a one-stop shop that offers all of this to the food industry. We want to be able to offer these services to small businesses as well as medium and large food companies. And over the years, as we've grown and expanded, we've been able to do that. So we do play the role as an educator for our food entrepreneurs, our tenants. Um, they have different backgrounds. Most of them do not have backgrounds in food science, uh, food manufacturing, dairy science, they, they, they come from a variety of different backgrounds. And so we have um, a 14 step process designed to eliminate some of the confusion that is involved in getting your product into the, the grocery store. And we walk with them through each of these steps um, and guide them through the process. Uh, we have guidelines for coming up with new product ideas, how to develop proto prototypes, as well as marketing and sales strategy. Um, the tenants of the program are also producing their product in facilities that are inspected by the Louisiana Department of Health and the Food and Drug Administration. At this time, we're not doing any products that are inspected by the USDA, the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, in the future, that is something we would like um, to be able to offer because a lot of companies do ask us for that, but at this time, we're not doing that. But the great thing is a lot of companies are actually starting out um, making their products at home under the Louisiana cottage law. They are allowed to make certain types of products, not everything, but certain types of products that they can sell direct to consumer. But when they want to get into a grocery store, they do need to be making that product in a manu an inspected facility. And so that's where a lot of tenants come to us. Um, in addition to that, we provide these services to the food industry. Um, logo and label design, um, Marta Panseri, she, she will work with companies to design their logo, to design their label, um, nutrition panels. I personally do a lot of nutrition panels for food companies, large and small, across the board, even restaurants. Product testing, process authority review, Dr. Beinecke is our process authority. Um, research and development. If a company just has an idea and says, hey, I want to make this product, but I have no idea how to do it, can you help me? Um, we'll go back and work with them, um, write a project proposal, and see if they want to do that. And then we can actually work with them to develop a product. Most of the time, companies are coming to, to us with, with a recipe already in place, and we're just helping them um, with minor adjustments to make a product shelf stable. But we have done projects where we've actually developed a product, product from start to finish. Um, and also consumer testing, sensory testing, and food processing and recall plans. Uh, here is one of our facilities. We do have the bottling lines that Dr. Bonnicky spoke about, um, dairy processing, he mentioned this as well. 
uh, seafood processing, blast chilling and freezing. By and large, most of our tenants are doing beverages and hot processing. Um, so that's the beverages, soups, sauces, stews, salsas, anything acidified we can do in our facility, um, jams and jellies. And then also in our animal and food science lab building, we have our baking kitchen um, and dry processing. So a lot of them are doing uh, cakes, candies, um, breads, confectionery products. We also do have the capability for them to make seasoning blends. So we do have a lot of different types of products that can be produced in our facilities. Since its in inception, there have been 125 full-time and 83 part-time jobs um, that have been added to the economy. Um, in addition, uh, it benefits the local economy through property taxes, sales taxes, insurance, um, graphic design, website design. We do have a list of companies that we try to recommend local companies for people to use whenever they need assistance with this type of thing. So a little bit about the history of our program. I mentioned we started with 10 companies and you can see over the years we've added about three to four companies per year. Um, in general, we do see that uh, three to four companies added each year. If you look at 2019 to 2020, we had 35 companies both years. Uh, it looks like we haven't added companies, but actually in the past year, we added four new companies. Um, we did have some that decided not to continue operations for various reasons um, because 2020 was a difficult year, but we have had four other companies that have added um, in 2020 because in the past year we have been extremely busy with this program because we've seen a huge increase in demand for people to get their products into the grocery stores and we have about 10 companies right now that are in the process of joining our program probably about six that are about to get their permit with the Louisiana Department of Health and another four to five that are somewhere in the stages of our 14-step process um, so because over here, people have been staying home more, they're cooking more, they're not going out to eat. And so the business for the demand for groceries has been huge. And so we've been extremely busy this year. We have also been fortunate to be able to have our facilities be available for our local food companies to be able to continue producing their product um, even during these times where there have been shutdowns and things like that to meet the increased demand. We've had several companies that have had co-packers where their product is being produced or was being produced shut down due to COVID and they actually were able to come to us and produce in our facilities. So that's been great that we've been able to offer that, that um, option to companies as well as not just during COVID, but Dr. Bonnicky mentioned natural disasters, uh, the, the popsicle company that came to us because of a hurricane that hit uh, Louisiana. And so it's it's great that we're able to provide that service to companies. And you can see we've grown in 2013, there was 3.5 tons of product being produced. And if you, you we've grown every year. And in 2020, we estimated about 140 tons of product being produced. This is by and large due to the opening of the bottling line that Dr. Beinecke mentioned. Um, it, it can produce much more than than our facilities in Ingram Hall. And so the companies that are kind of outgrowing the capacity of our facilities in Ingram are able to move up to this next size um, bottling line to be able to produce more product to meet the demand and get their product into shelves. And we expect this to continue for 2021. Other benefits has been the, the benefits that students get working in our program. They are getting hands-on experiences in food processing, preservation, product development, food safety, labeling regulations, nutrition labeling, all of this, we work with the students in each of these areas. And so whenever they graduate, they are, they are taking um, well-paying food science positions in companies such as Nestle Purina, um, Mars Incorporated, Keurig Dr. Pepper, HEB, which is a grocery store chain here, um, Burger King. So they're really getting great opportunities whenever they go out into into after they graduate to get 
these food scientist positions because of the experience that they're getting in our program. We have student workers. I mentioned two of them that are food science um, in our program. We have internships and we have volunteer opportunities. So maybe someone just wants to get more experience. They can volunteer to go help a company and learn some of these things. We also have an educational series. Initially, we designed them as a way to help our tenants with things like marketing and sales, label design, how to price your product. And we did that because with our 14 step process, we get a lot of the same questions over and over um, from companies about how to do these, these different things. So we, audit, we started doing these educational series to help our tenants where we bring in experts from Louisiana Department of Health or um, Louisiana Business and Technology Center or marketing companies that are local here that help show companies kind of what they need to do whenever they're starting out. We also have food processing and safety trainings. Uh, we've offered good manufacturing practices for companies. Um, Dr. Beinecke uh, does the Better Process Control School, uh, and he's done it in the past. And um, sensory trainings with Dr. Watun Prinyawatkul, who oversees the Sensory Services Lab. Um, and so we, we, our educational series are designed not only for small tenants, but also for food companies of, of any size who are looking to find out more information about some of these topics. And we've recently added a series of online cooking classes. Um, Marta is from Italy and she is going to be doing a pizza making um, cooking class um, at the end of the month. And so this is a fun way for us to reach out with, with the broad audience to let them know about what the incubator does. And if they ever need our services in the future, then they, they know how to contact us. Um, I mentioned the variety of products. We have 136 products that are being made in our facilities. Again, most of them are acidified foods, salad dressings, barbecue sauces, um, hot sauces, dipping sauces, sports drinks, iced teas, those type of products. We do have some jellies, gelato, um, the dairy-based dips that are being made in, in the creamery, and then lots of different baked products and candies and some honey products as well. So we have these 136 products, and since 2013, we've had over, we've assisted over 400 companies with our technical services um, since our program began. And the great thing for us is that a lot of these companies are medium to large size food companies, and they come back to us after we do something like a nutrition label or a sensory test, and they'll come back to us. And so that repeat business is a great way for us to keep supporting the food industry. I do want to touch briefly on our Ag Center Sensory Services Lab. Uh, they partner with us, the Food Incubator, very much. Again, it's under the direction of Dr. Wittoon. Most of these services are offered to medium to large side food companies who are looking to maybe introduce a new product into the marketplace, or maybe they changed an ingredient, or maybe they have an issue with the current product and they want to get consumer feedback to see if they can tell a difference. Uh, we do have a database of about 800 people um, in Baton Rouge, so we can call them in based on the demographics that the company wants um, and then do these, these consumer studies. Uh, in the past year, because most of our consumer testing has been in person, um, we've, we've actually done some home use testing where we work with the company and we send the products home for consumers to evaluate that way. So we've still been able to, to get our work done for companies um, and be able to offer this service um, even in spite of COVID restrictions. And I do want to touch a little bit about our incubator and innovation center. Um, ideally, uh, this is going to combine our current incubator and technical services lab programs, as well as strengthen partnerships with other faculty that we are already working with within the Ag Center um, to assist food companies of all sizes, um, both local, national, and international companies. This, it would be located um, at the entrance to campus, so there wouldn't be any restrictions to, to actually enter the, the campus. Right now, our tenants have to go through the gates. We do have the bottling line built out. That is um, the area that is off to at the top of the screen. Um, that's where the bottling line is located, but the, the goal is to, to have one building um, where all of the following 
will be located and, and, and kind of serve to be the premier facility of its kind in the South with commercial processing rooms, uh, a bottling line, a demo kitchen, a technical services lab, refrigeration, dry and freezer spaces, commercial and unloading areas, lobbies, offices for our tenants, meeting spaces, and even a storefront where we're able to highlight the products that are produced in, in our food incubator. Um, this is the bottling line that, that Dr. Beinecke was showing you a video of. Um, beverages, soups, sauces, salsas, jams, and jellies are produced here. Um, so in addition to allowing our tenants who, who have maybe outgrown the facilities in, in our other buildings um, and need to produce more product, they're able to use these facilities but it also allows us to collaborate and, and produce innovative products for other Louisiana food companies by allowing these companies who may not have the bottling capabilities at this time to come in and use this facility to maybe do test batches of new products that they're considering launching uh, before they invest in this type of equipment at their facility. So it really helps further collaborations with, with the food industry, which is what we're always looking for. Uh, we really want to be able to support them in any way that we can. This is another photo of the bottling line. And that is it. If anyone has any questions. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, uh, now we can discuss. I really liked your presentation. Our situation is uh, slightly different, but uh, we have the same goals. And uh, uh, here is one related question from Vice Rector Jufan in chat. Uh, he appreciate uh, uh, the presentation and achievements. And uh, do you have any recommendation on how to start some success factors of the incubator project. Uh, can you can you answer, uh, Miss Gutierrez? Well, like I said, we started we started um, working with with small food companies. Um, and and Gay, our director, will tell you we started um, with with really a, a kettle to bottle, and and our tenants were bottling by hand. And then we just grew as it became successful. Um, and so that's. That's how we've been doing, and we've been very fortunate that we've had um, the support of the Ag Center um, all the way through. And so we also had a grant to be able to purchase equipment like our bottling line and the automatic bottling machine in Ingram. So we've been able to grow um, as, as time went on. Um, the grant also helped to support our staff. Um, because when we started, like I said, it was Gay, our director, and one other food scientist. And you see we've been able to grow over time to add more support staff to be able to, to help the program grow and provide all the services that we've been able to provide. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. King and uh, Dr. Beneke uh, responding to my question in the chat. Uh, so uh, about uh, possible cooperation in uh, any projects with our department, uh, if we, it will be possible. Uh, later we would uh, connect you with our offer in uh, some educational or science project. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, I think uh, it will be uh, very good for uh, LSU and Mendelu. So. Uh, I, I see the question of uh, Professor Balik. How many employees does uh, the incubator? Um, well, our our staff is is what I showed you. It, it's the six of us. Um, Dr. Beinecke is is in the the School of Nutrition and Food Science as well, and he manages the creamery, but he's also works with us uh, as the PA and the, with the bottling line, um, and so the. The, it, it's us and our and our student workers, uh, but the companies that that rent out the facilities, they bring their own workers um, to to make the product. So we we don't provide uh, employees to actually make the product for them. They they provide that. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank you very much. Another question or some notes? If not. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for your presentation.
Thank we you. will send you uh, some some emails and uh, we will be happy to cooperate. Uh, thank so thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the last step of uh, our program uh, will be uh, the uh, presentation of my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Radka Langová. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, she is uh, an expert in food of plant origin and preservation, uh, but she cannot uh, join us. So I will, uh, I will uh, share the video uh, with uh, her. So the last one will be uh, this uh, uh, contribution. Hello, my name is Radka Langová. I will guide you through this part of presentation. I want to introduce uh, you our plant production team. Uh, Tomáš Gregor is aimed to brewery and malt production. Aludek Hrivna's field of work is field crops and its processing. Vera Šutníková is our bakery and cereal technology specialist and my aim is food preservation. The scope of our section is mostly bakery, malting, brewery, pastry, and food preservation. In bakery, we aim to substitution of gluten in the products uh, because of worldwide increasing numbers of people with celiac disease. We add fiber to bakery products because of its beneficial properties and positive effect on the human organism as its association with body weight and insulin levels in the blood. The plant processing byproducts of use are leftovers after oil pressing or peels from grapes. Several patents have been created in this area. In brewery, we try to use non-traditional type of melts. We, for example, sorghum, buckwheat, or quinoa. These beers have significant cereal taste. Beers made of pseudo cereals are also gluten-free and contain more soluble fiber. Now we are thinking about production of a mango beer. Our students uh, have also opportunity to study pastry. In many cases, it is their hobby. They enjoy it and like to try new recipes and interesting ingredients. You can see a few examples of their products made in practice on the pictures. In food preservation, uh, we work with both animal and plant products. Uh, we usually use heat preservation, uh, fermentation, heat drying or freeze drying, but we also use uh, plant ex extracts. We analyze uh, the quality parameters of the final products. The texture and color is analyzed uh, in fresh ingredients and preserved products. To assess the quality of the products, we use uh, sensory microbiology analysis, and we are also able to analyze the vitamins content in the products and during the process of preservation and water activity uh, for dried products. In case of drying grapes on bunch stem, uh, we tried uh, different types of drying methods. Uh, we tested quality parameters of final products. As a result of this study, we publish article in scientific uh, journal uh, Foods. Within uh, one of our uh, diploma theses, uh, we freeze dried uh, different kinds of fruits and vegetables and analyzed their parameters of quality. We assessed change of color, vitamin C content and sensory characteristics and its microbiology. 
Within other diploma thesis, we processed rose hips uh, to different types of products uh, because rose hips are a very good source of vitamin C and antioxidants. Uh, we made, for example, jam, syrup, liqueur or wine. In last season, uh, we have started uh, to do new experiments with artichoke, which we are sterilizing in different pickles. We also make an artichoke drinks made of fresh uh, and dried petals, which allows us to use the whole artichoke and thus use the whole flower. The activity is done in cooperation with company as a part of new product uh, development in delicatessen. In the future, uh, we want to aim to fermentation of fish products and vegetables. Other term uh, will be a cold pressing of oil from walnuts and the use of the cake from this process. Uh, we are searching for more gentle processes of food preservation to keep its nutritional and sensory properties and microbiological quality. Uh, we are also aiming uh, to reduction of waste from production processes. If you were interested in that you've seen, we are ready to cooperate with you in these fields. That is all from me for now and thank you for your attention. So, thank you uh, for the contribution uh, to Dr. Langova. And, uh, but uh, it is not uh, live. Uh, we can, we can uh, continue in uh, discussion because uh, we are in the end of the program. If you have uh, some uh, questions, you can uh, send in chat or uh, who are you speakers you can ask uh, live. Uh, I see no questions, uh, but uh, I think uh, the time is uh, very good. Uh, we can, we can uh, finish with uh, my few uh, notes. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, it was a great, great uh, occasion for uh, food technologists to present uh, their themes in this beautiful program of the Food Symposium. And uh, the, the, the food technologist is, uh, uh, is a universal specialist. Uh, have to know and uh, fully understand the contest of fields uh, through chemistry, microbiology, also sensory evaluation, and more and more. And thanks to that, is able to handle with production of any food, I think. So uh, the food technologies is a universal human being for everything. So areas such as uh, food security, so enough food for the population, uh, food safety, uh, uh, the safety uh, of food to survive, consumption, and uh, uh, some humans. You can you can uh, join us uh, in food symposium program in Friday, uh, and nutrition you can heard in Wednesday in in a, a block uh, of uh, my colleagues uh, from uh, LSU and Mendel University. So a good food technologist must understand all areas and uh, he must have uh, imagination, patience and be creative. So tomorrow we, we, we can uh, join the food symposium for food safety. Be sure to join in and take the opportunity to listen uh, to our LSU experts. So uh, I think then uh, will be a brief summary of the food safety, food technology and nutrition uh, areas with me and my colleague and some offers for cooperation. So I am big fan of that. 
thank you. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. And now you have the opportunity to ask last last question in discussion. So if you have. Hi, this is Joan King. Perfect. <laughs> I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how your undergraduate food science program is set up as far as coursework and and if it's an approved program by any organization, that kind of thing. OK, uh, we have uh, we have uh, students in uh, Baker degree, uh, master's degree and doctoral degree. Uh, we can cooperate in uh, some uh, different levels of uh, cooperation, I think, uh, some in, in education, some in uh, science. Uh, so uh, we can uh, discuss uh, in Friday if you if you have a time, uh, Dr. King. I will have to check my schedule, <laughs> but okay, what time okay. will you be doing that? Okay, there the, I think uh, will be a uh, uh, very good time and uh, possibility to discussion. So in a round table discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, another note or questions? If not, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to everyone and uh, be healthy and thank you for your attention.